Welcome, welcome. Come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. I greet you in the joy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you know it's possible to go to a restaurant or be surrounded by food and die of starvation? Did you know that you could go to the doctor and go to the gym regularly and yet not receive the whole message of health and die of bad health? You know, Psalm 23 says, my friends, it says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now he takes you to the green pasture, but he's not going to punch the grass down your throat. He leads you to the water, but he's not going to shove your head in there and force you to drink it. We're talking about one word, my brothers and my sisters. It's called receptivity. What good is it if it's in front of you, but you won't receive it? I believe today God's going to set you free from some blockades that have kept you from receiving everything he has for you. So stay tuned as we get into this exciting word, receptivity. Can you receive what God has for you? You can? Can you receive what God has for you? Can you receive what God has for you? Will you receive what God has for you? Do you want to receive what God has for you? A lot of times we want the stuff of God with, by way of omitting the connection that we need with God. And that's not necessarily the case. If you ever get something that will clip you from God, it's not God. God will never give you something that will clip you or downgrade what he's doing in your life. Now, if you get something that God has given you, it is a blessing. If you seek the blessing more than the God who gave it to you, it will become a curse. Okay, amen? You know, hearing the voice of God makes you privy to the secrets of God and the blessings of God. All you need is God's voice. A lot of times if you're going through tragedy, if you're going through struggle, if you're going through trials, what you need is a plan. And that plan will get you out of anything. If you have a word from God, you will make it through anything. You have to convince yourself of this. So what we need to do is we need to hear the voice of the Lord. That's what we need. More than $50, more than a nice suit, more than entrance into Harvard or more than anything, what we need is a word from God. If you have a word from God, it will sustain you. If you have the word of God that says he will supply all of my needs, you don't need a car. You need the word and the word will get you the car. It would be worse for you to get the car and not learn to hear the voice of God. If you never want to feel like people have their thumb on you or you're being oppressed or you feel like you're being controlled, it's because you need to learn to hear the voice of God. The voice of God will snap you out of a crazy spell. The voice of God will snap you out of depression. The voice of God will give you exactly what you need to do and to go where you got all you need is the word from God. As you go in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12, I'm going to show you that if you want it, and not only do you want it, but you need it, are you open to it? Jesus began teaching or to speak to them in parables in Mark chapter 12 verse 1 I'm reading. And a man planted a vineyard, Jesus said. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press. He built a tower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant. Somebody say, he sent a servant. He sent a servant. But they rejected his servant. They weren't open to his servant. He sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. Verse 3. But they seized him. They beat him. They sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. Somebody say, he sent another servant. Yes, See, God will keep trying to get to you. God will keep trying to get to you. Are you open? They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he still sent another one. Uh, and that one they killed. And he sent many others. Some of them they beat. Others they killed. He had one left to send. Who was it, y'all? A son. Who was it? It said a son whom he loved. And he sent him last of all saying, they'll respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the error. Come, the, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. 
What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others? Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priest and the teachers of the law and all the elders look for a way to arrest him because they heard this parable. Because they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd so they left him and went away. 2 Corinthians 7, 6 through 9, and then we jump from verses 13 to 15, says, But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming, the, receive, the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, somebody say, he's coming. he's coming. See, God will send something, but can you receive it? He'll send a servant. He'll send a word. He sent his son. He'll send it all the time. By the time you fall into a pit, it's because you have rejected the things that God has been sending your way. I keep saying Samson lost his vision way before they poked his eyes out. Because God will send you cues. God will send you clues. Right now, God is talking to you through his servant. When you leave, God may talk to you through nature. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Let me tell you something. There should never be a lack for God's word among God's people. There's never been a lack for God's word, only a lack for hearers of the word. And we learned three weeks ago that God is a, is a communicating being, thereby implicating that he's created listening beings. Isn't that something? I was designed, say with me, I was designed to listen. That's why Satan fights you when you're hearing God's voice. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And not only, by, uh, not only by his coming, but also by the comfort in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 2, of, uh, chapter 7, it says, uh, by the comfort you had given him. If I could have some water, I'm dying up here. Anybody here, a porter? He told us about your lodging for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Verse 8, let's read it together in concert. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and you were so not harmed in any way by us. Somebody say with me, did you get the message? In other words, God sent a sorrowness and the message was repent. Sometimes God sends you a, a tragedy because you're not listening, but are you getting the message? How many times, tell your neighbor, how many times does God have to tell you? And I don't know why I lost the house and I don't know why God is talking to you. I told you guys two weeks ago, a friend of mine who's much older He's my senior in the Lord and an overseer of mine. And he said uh, to me, how he shared with me, uh, I've been to two funerals today, Conrad. And uh, he's just been busy. And, and I had told, oh, no, this week I've been to two funerals. And he was, you know, just breathing hard. He's an old man. And then uh, I said, him, hey, man, have you seen the color purple? And he goes, yeah. And I said, God is trying to tell you something. I said, you're getting old. Get ready for your funeral, man. That's why God's got you going to funerals. And he laughed. That's me joking around. But God was sending a message of sorrow or a, God was sending a situation of sorrow and teaching you to repent. Verse 13 says, by all this we are encouraged. In addition to your own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit was refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you and you had not embarrassed me, but just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. His affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with great fear and trembling. Now we went all the way to this scripture because Jesus told us to. And secondly, because Paul had sent a letter and guess what? They had received it. Paul had sent a servant and guess what? They had received him and he went home happy. And so you see a happy Paul coming back or a happy Paul receiving message and a happy Titus coming back. Corinth, 
The book of Corinthians was written to people in a city called Corinth. The citizens of Corinth are called Corinthians, like people from Houston are called Houstonians. And so Paul sends them a letter, and Paul's always dealing with issues. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know how many of you ever answer letters or ever reject letters. I don't answer letters that don't have an address, a complete address with the real name. I don't answer them. I don't open them. Unless I like, kind of look through the light if there's some money or something and there are checks. But I don't answer them. If people send me letters, because when you're in ministry, sometimes people don't like you. And I've experienced getting letters in the ministry that were very hateful and judgmental over the years in ministry. I mean, I've gotten letters. Uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, maybe I'll just bring some one day to you. I don't even save them. I throw them away. Because I don't need the devil's words near me. But the fact of the matter is, if something don't have a return address, I don't even deal with it. Interestingly, I was in California not long ago and I bought uh, some suits, very cheap, cheaper than you can get in Mexico. And so I put them in a box about this big, about as big as this pulpit and about this high. And I had a mail to me. And I remember that I didn't put a return address on the box. And the lady, I was in Koreatown right there in, uh, near, in LA, but in Koreatown, it's a very large part of it. They have a large Koreatown. And I remember going to the post office and I remember she said, you need a return address on this. And I got an attitude because I was so frustrated because before I sent the box, I was already agitated that she had said, uh, sir, you need tape on that box. And I said, yes, uh, the lady in the, in, the, in the line who was instructing us to get ready for the window. And uh, I said, yeah, I said, I'll just get some tape up there when I get to the window. She said, sir, we don't provide tape. I said, are you kidding me? You don't provide tape? You're not embarrassed to tell me that you don't provide tape? And she said, no, but we sell tape. And it was for $3.92 or some ridiculous off number price. And I said, well, then I guess I'll just take one of the tapes. And I started taping the box and everything, just all ghetto and just upset and everything. And then when I got to the front line, uh, the lady said, uh, sir, we can't send this because it needs a return address. And I said, I'm not from California. She said, we still can't send it. And the box wasn't facing in my direction to where I could write on it this way. It was now facing to where the address was facing to my left and she was facing me. So it was facing that way. And I said, well, can I have a pen? And I just started writing on it down like if it was Chinese or something. And I just said, put like, you know, a hotel. Culver City was where I was staying, which is just a little town. It's all LA, LA. And then she said, what does that say? And I said, I don't know. I said, and I gave her the name of my hotel. And then she said, what street is it on? Because I just had to put the city in the name. And then I just was being dumb, just scribbling it on. I said, here, hurry up, send it. And then she said, you could have just put the same address that, you forward, that you're sending your mail to. <laughs> well, I felt this little. And I said, I'm so sorry. I tend to get stupid when I get frustrated. The lady never got upset with me. She never responded to my anger. She just stayed kind to the point she made me feel upset, kind of like my wife. As soon as I get so upset, but she's so kind to me, I just feel this little. But you know, God talks to us, and if we let our emotions and everything get in the way, it's gonna block you to what God is saying. And let me tell you something. The best thing Satan can do is block God's voice. The best thing Satan can do is you, the best thing you can let Satan do, rather, is block God's voice. So I want you to just hear this. God sends, but do you depend? God always sends a word. But don't ever treat God's word like good advice among other advice. I know Mexicanos, we have comadres, and we have our camaradas, and, you know, we have our homeboys, and we got our, or the girls say besties, and I don't know what the heck, and whatever y'all say. Their advice is not equal or as important as the Word of God. Do you hear me? You may go to a psychologist. People may have a lot of degrees, but they're not as important, their counsel, as the Word of God. Did you know that? You got to stand under the Word of the Lord. Now, this is real simple. Stick with me. I don't care what advice anybody gives you. You seek the counsel of the Lord. Now let me go a little bit further. From palatable to applicable. We read right there in verse 8. Can you read that again in verse 8 with me of 2 Corinthians 7? It says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Wow. Have you ever had to tell somebody that? Or remember somebody like, it hurts your feelings, you know? Some of you have told me, Bishop, you hurt my feelings when you said this or Bishop that. And I can't tell you I'm sorry. I can't. Because I would be saying I'm sorry when God is not sorry. God doesn't, did you know, if you look in the Bible, brothers and sisters, you never find Jesus going back or retracting on anything he ever said. Go. 
Here in San Antonio or the San Antonio Express News, and I'll say it, they report a lot of false information or skewed info that's in a, in a, in a bad light. Uh, and so sometimes newspapers here or wherever you live, uh, they have to print retractions. And because they don't want to ever admit they're wrong, usually the retractions are real tiny at the back of the newspaper. But if you look in the Bible, our Lord Jesus, he never retracted on anything he's ever said. Even the times that he said things that seemingly seem rough, and he would say, don't you get it already? I'm not talking about real bread. I told you I'm the, don't you get it? Are you dark in your thinking? Are you ignorant? He never said, hey guys, you know last night, when you guys were talking about the bread and I'm so sorry I called you dumb. Never. Because if Jesus says you're dumb, you're dumb. <laughs> now he don't make dummies, but if you're acting dumb, right? When he told the disciples after he finished preaching and he had 5,000 people he had fed an estimated 25 to 30,000 because Jewish families are very big. Even today, Orthodox Jewish families have an average of seven to eight children each family. I met a young lady in California. I was joking around with her. She's 35 years old. She has seven children, and she was pregnant with her eighth, and she's a security at LAX, and we pray for those at LAX at the airport because just this past Friday there was a shooting, and, and it was real crazy. So I checked on them, see if they were okay. They were okay, and uh, I was joking around with her and everything, and then uh, when I left, I told her I was preaching there at a revival, and I said, uh, bye, black, snow white, and your seven dwarves. <laughs> We were joking around, you know. And uh, I guess what I was trying to get at is um, there would have been about twenty-five to 30,000. Talk about church growth, amen? amen? Jesus' church went from nothing to twelve to 5,000 to twenty-five to 30,000. And after the church is over, he starts talking to the disciples later on. He turns around and he tells his immediate 12. He, everybody started leaving him. Because he started telling them, if you want to follow me, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And some of them, it was too hard, so they left his church. If Jesus lost church members, pastors, if you're listening, or bishops, or members here, you know, don't be discouraged when people leave. Keep doing the will of God. People are not your gauge. God is your gauge. That day, just about all the 5,000 and 25 to 30,000 had left him. And Jesus turned around and told his faithful few, his deacons, his elders, his board. And he said, do y'all want to leave me too? He never went back and retracted and said, hey guys, remember the day when we had a big church split and people didn't like my sermon, even after I fed them miraculously and all this stuff has been going down and all this stuff. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean if you guys want. He never retracted. So I want to say it again. Palatable and applicable. Paul tells them, even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. He said, though I did regret it, he said, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. The Bible says better are the wounds of, an, uh, of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. Are you hearing me today? Yes. Look at your name and tell him, can God front you? Why am I saying this? Because God's word is not always going to be palatable to you. Palatable is a word that means acceptable or it tastes good to you. Ooh, yesterday I woke up and I had wanted some pot roast. Oh my God, I wanted some pot roast. I don't know what it is. I don't think I'm pregnant or what, but I wanted pot roast. So I start looking up best pot roast in San Antonio. That's not the best way to look for food, by the way. And then every little sudden it came into my mind, a vision from heaven. Golden Corral's got some good pot roast. I might just go there today again. It tastes so good. Let me get back into the servant. Palatable means something that tastes good to your mouth. Something that sounds right to your mind. Something that feels good to your feelings. Somebody say your taste, your mind, and your feelings. Sometimes God will talk to you and it won't taste good to your brain. In your thinking, you'll think it's crazy. God will tell you you're broke and the voice of God may come and say, give the last $2 in your pocket. Can God tell you something? Can he really? Even if it doesn't make sense to your brain. What if it hurts your feelings? Can you receive it? Because what I'm talking to you about today as I begin to make my way to concluding this message is called receptivity. 
When it's good, it's good. When the meal is good, it's just good. When God's word is good, it's just good. You know, I've said for years, what makes food so delicious is really not spices. Is hunger. I know you're hearing this word of receptivity and it's reaching your heart. It's touching you right there where you're at. And so I want you to just continue to let God minister to you. Tell a friend, you can still come and check it out. Connect with us and, and let God just pour into your life what he's been pouring to you. You just heard us talk about God sends, but do you depend? You know, if God's going to send it, treat it like you depend on it don't treat god's counsel like an option don't treat it as a word among many depend on the word of god for the bible says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of god he's sending on he's sending it but are you depending on it receptivity is the ability to receive I remember growing up listening to Lloyd Ogilvie when I was a kid. Don't ask me why a kid likes to listen to a Presbyterian minister. But I remember we had this little black and white long television on the counter in the kitchen. And I remember listening to Lloyd Ogilvie. He pastored the Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. I was there last week. I went to the church and, and I've been there twice already. And uh, now he's, he's a chaplain over the Senate, the U.S. Senate. But I remember listening to Lloyd Ogilvie. And the TV that I would listen to him on, it was a little black and white. Ooh, it had bad reception. Any of y'all remember them TVs where you put some, some uh, you put a hanger, and then you put some aluminum foil, and then, you know, they would make you get up and jinger, turn the antenna, and then it didn't work. After a while, you wouldn't sit down. They'd tell you five times. After a while, you knew about the sixth time you weren't coming back because you were going to have to stay watching TV like this. Right? The TV didn't have good reception. But there are a lot of Christians that the reason their life is goofy and not totally biblical and that they give off a, a, a bad reception or vision of Jesus is because they don't hear the voice of God clearly. Therefore, they don't got the message coming. Therefore, they don't hear the Jesus that tells us not to be drinking and smoking and clubbing and sleeping around. Oh, my goodness. It's quiet up in here, up in here, up in here. Sometimes people call you and the reception is bad, correct? And it cuts off key words and what they're saying. And so you try to piece the message together and you might get it and you might not get it. Some people, they get pieces of God's word. And so you talk to other people that claim to love Jesus, but they live a homosexual lifestyle. They're pro-abortion. Pro they, they're pro, I mean, they, they conveniently lie. And yet they say they love Jesus. Don't let them confuse you. They should be listening to you. Somebody say, I have the word of the Lord. Somebody say, I want all of God's word. Paul held no punches, even if it hurt their feelings. He said, I got to tell you this, even if it hurts you, this is how it works. Palatable. Even if it's not palatable. I don't like the way Bishop told me that. I don't like, is it the word of the Lord? Also, when you are being used to deliver the word from the Lord, make no apologies. Listen, some people, no matter how much cinnamon and sugar and honey and spice and cookies and free movie passes you give them, they don't want to be corrected. And we live in a day and age of political correctness. I'm reading a book right now, Christians Living in a PC World by John Benton, written from, uh, from London. A great book on how society wants to muffle us with political correctness. It's even come in the church where we can't say the truth like submission and, and covering. And it, it you know, my goodness, I, I, that's just a whole other sermon. Not everything God tells you is going to be initially palatable to you, agreeable or pleasant to you, but it will be the best for you. Did you get that? It will be the best for you. Say God's word is the best for me. God's word is the best for me. That's exactly what God wants. He wants the best for you. Even if it doesn't sound right. Even if it doesn't sound good, God wants the best for you. Confess, it's an acquired taste. Thank you for the two of you that did it. It's an acquired taste. Confess, it's an acquired taste. 
Psalm 34, it says, Test and, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. Amen. Hebrews 6, 5 says, who have tested the goodness of the word of God or the word of the Lord. Yeah, the word of God. Taste means, uh, the word taste is used in a symbolic way. It means palatable. Palatable. I'm going to ask you again. If your feelings get in the way because you don't like what is being said, that will choke God's word from talking to you. And I just told you, all you need is God's word to get through anything. I confess to you today here at the River Worship Center that I am in the word of God doing the will of God by pastoring this church. That's what matters to me. And everything else will line up for me and come to me. When you obey God like Moses, you don't even have to look for water in the desert. God will make water come up from the rock. And God punished Moses because he told him not to strike the rock, but to what? Speak to the rock. That's word. God will make provision come from anything when you have the word. You've got to put the word into practice. I've always said the word works if you work the word. Just because it doesn't sound right doesn't mean it's bad. God's voice must go from palatable and graduate to applicable. Somebody say applicable. applicable. What good is it to know something if you don't apply it? What good is it to buy the diet pill if you don't drink it? What good is it to get the, the hemorrhoid cream if you don't apply it? Right? You come to me, I'm the doctor, I give you some hemorrhoid cream. You come back later and say, did it work? No. Did you get the cream? Yeah. Did you put it on? No. That's the problem. You got it, but you don't apply it. We're talking about receptivity. I said, we're talking about receptivity. We tell you, Bishop, I have this problem. You need to do this. Have you done it? No. And you keep coming to me for counseling for the same thing. Nothing's going to change, my friend, until you start applying it. I'm not going to take the cream off and put it for you. God gave you the word. It's up to you to apply it the way it is. Don't be like some of us that the doctor tells us to take, to take 10 milligrams and we don't feel we're sick enough. So we take 5 milligrams and then we share 5 milligrams with our cousin. And then our mama gives us and we're cross medicating each other and wondering why we're never totally getting healed. The cough gets better, but it never goes away. Right? And so for this week, my friend behaved well, but no man, no woman. You got to apply it. So let me tell you something real quick again. Treat God's word like your life depends on it because it does. Sunday is the most important day of the week for you because it's setting the word of the Lord for the rest of the week. This is why Satan fights you reading the Bible. I'm teaching you receptivity, how to hear God's voice. God wants to talk to you about detail stuff. Listen to me. God wants to tell you about physics. God wants to tell you about whatever it is that you need to hear. And he will. I was reading about 5 o'clock this morning, the word of God, and I think it's 2 Samuel chapter 7, where David was going to get attacked. And, he, and, and there were sometimes God would give David long instructions. And then there was sometimes like this one, he would say, is Saul going to come and look for me in this city and kill all the people from the city just because they hid me? And God said, he will. And then he goes, should I leave? You should. But then there's other times where God says, don't do this and don't do that and do this because this and that and the other. Why is it that sometimes God's instruction is, and sometimes it's, it doesn't matter. If you just do what God says, it'll set you free. And God, what do I do? My life is falling apart. I'm not happy. And I, and then, and I, go to church on Sunday. And God, what should I do? After you give your tithe, I want you to give $5 to this one. I want you to give $2 to this one. I want you to reinvest this one. Then I want you to go to... Whatever he's saying, do it. Hallelujah. Depend on it. Yes. Can I share with you that might sound a little creepy? I even ask God, I even let God tell me how to pay my bills. If God tells me to put an extra 200 on a bill, I know it sounds creepy. It might be just for me. I'll do it. I don't know what it is. He'll tell me, do this, put an extra on this, pay an extra payment on that. If you don't pay this, it's going to come back and bite you at the end of the month. Now, that's called budgeting, friends. You don't need God's voice. But some of us, 
<laughs> we need God's voice. Those of us who, who are not yet trimmed and chiseled and sculptured like me, we even need God to tell us, don't eat that. I already told you don't eat that. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Did I just hit your feeling? Your opinion? Do you want to hear God's voice? Are you receptive to God's voice? My next point is this. In receptivity, real quick, I put Psalm 23, 2 says, He makes me lie down in what? Green pastures. And he leads me beside still waters. Jesus will take you to the grass. I've said it before, but he's not going to punch it down your throat. You've got to be receptive to what he puts in front of you. He'll lead you to the water, but he's not going to get your head like the mob and drown you in it. They say that, don't they? You can lead a horse to water. Receptivity. This is why you can be in a restaurant and die of salvation because you refuse to accept the food. This is, how, this is how you can go to a college, even to a university, and graduate somehow and be completely ignorant because you didn't receive, like you should have, the information you should. This is how you can live in the midst of a multitude of counselors, but if you don't follow the advice, you can live a miserable life because you're not receptive. This is how you can join a health club and never lose weight because you're not receptive to the health message. Are you hearing me today? This is how you can come to church all your life and go straight to hell, just like those in Revelation that Jesus says, didn't we heal in your name? Didn't we cast out demon in your name? And, but, but my mom reads the Bible, but the Bible, but we have, we have, but receptivity means if it's coming in, you're giving the clear signal out. Anybody here want to hear God's voice again? Are you receptive to God's voice? What if he says something that hurts your feelings? What if he says something crazy like, get your son, Abraham, your only son, and sacrifice him? I rebuke that that's not God. Why? Because I don't agree with that. that God. Wow. My next point is this. I'm taken so I can't hear you, God. This could have been a lesson in Mark chapter 12 in good management, but it bears other points. Sometimes you can own something so much, God can't talk to you about it. I'm going to say this again. Sometimes you can own something so much, God can't talk to you about it because you won't listen. You won't listen? I love my boyfriend so much. I know I'm in sin. You won't hear God's voice Saturday in your life. There are people who come to church and you can't tell them nothing about their kids. Even though their kids are starting fires and stabbing deacons in the back and, you know, God knows doing what, chasing the mailman down the road. And when you correct them, my child never does anything wrong. You can own a... Some, some girls, they'll fall in love with, I've seen it as a singles pastor. They fall in love with the man and I prayed and God sent him, but all of a sudden he went awry and he's going cuckoo and now you're going cuckoo and then, God forbid, when it comes to him, you don't hear nobody. Because God, I'm taken, so I can't hear from you. Oh, 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 you can't give me advice because I have a bachelor's degree. Your bachelor's owns you so you can't hear God's voice. I'm trying to teach you how to hear God's voice. I'm trying to teach you how to hear God's voice. The thing is, you get owned by everything. The Bible says they killed the messenger's son. They had land that was rented. They didn't own it. It was rented. But they let the land own them. Therefore, they rejected every messenger sent their way. Brothers and sisters, your body is on loan to you. The money is on loan to you. This ministry, you're God's sheep, not mine. I'm just helping pastor, but I'm a sheep too. It's on loan. But if you let the stuff own you, You'll reject every messenger God sends to you to teach you how to deal with that marriage, deal with that family, deal with the money, everything. Because you know what? You will treat God's voice like it's an option among other voices. I'm laying a broad foundation for y'all to learn how to hear God's voice. 
Because I need to get you to the point that if God says, turn right here and don't go home through that street, turn right. I need to get you to the point where you not just pray for people, but where God says, you know what God is showing me? You have a problem with this part of your body and this is going on and the Holy Spirit is telling me to tell you this. I need to get you to the point where God says, you know what? Pull all your stocks and investments out because there's a crash coming and everybody says it's the best time in the market and you pull out. And it doesn't make any sense. It's not palatable to the world because they, they haven't tasted of the Lord like you and I have. I just feel the anointing on me, but I got to start wrapping it up already. Whoo! Everything we have on earth, we manage and administrate. So I'm going to put right, put right here. Can God talk to you about your kids? Can he address you about your job or your school? Hmm? Can he talk to you about your emotions? He can. He can say, hey, I know you're really mad. I know you're crying. Get up, stop crying. You don't have a reason to be mad. That's not what you need to be doing right now. Oh, that's not God, because that's not love. I don't regret that this letter hurts you. I'm glad it hurt you, but then I'm also, I also regret it hurt you. But in the end, the sorrow got sent. Did you get the message? You did, because you repented. Maybe God's talking to you right now. You know, I never have enough money for this. Are you tithing? I never this. Are you doing this and cutting back? Are, I ne are you listening? Or because you don't like it. Anybody getting something out of this today? You see, it's not just stuff, but everything belongs to God, and we must manage it and handle it. Oh, man, I'm telling you this is good. I'm going to talk to you. This next point as I close with this is called parable talk. Mark 12, 1 says what? Jesus then began to, to them in parables are what God would use and what it's been done before Jesus came. It's using stories or scenarios specifically that are not utilizing true characters. This is why I teach that hell is real. Because there are denominations today that teach that hell is not real. And that hell is figurative. And I always use the example of Lazarus. Not the one that was raised from the dead, but the other one where Jesus told the story about how Lazarus had gone to heaven and he saw his brothers in hell. And they had said, could you dip your finger in some water and pass through the gulf and give it to us? And I always tell people, the man was in hell. The man who went to heaven was Lazarus. Anytime Jesus uses a parable, they never allude to specific names. Ever. That means Lazarus was real and the man who went to hell was real. And there was a real Abraham's bosom. Now that's a whole other different Bible study. But I just want to teach you. This is a scenario or a story to get a message across to you. Right? Somebody say parable talk. If you, I'm telling you right now, because God talks to you in parables today. He'll show you other people acting a certain way. And if you don't get that story, except he's using real people. If you don't get the message, you're going to learn the hard way to hear God's voice. If you won't hear God's voice directly speaking to you, he will place you in a parable or a scenario that speaks loudly at you. I'm going to say that again because I, this is true. But you don't want to hear the voice of the Lord. If you won't hear God's voice speaking directly to you, he will place you in a scenario or a parable that speaks loudly at you. Oh, yes. The verse says, then Jesus began, started to speak. Right? This is what I want to get you to understand. My next point is, Jesus starts off speaking based on where you will start off listening. Jesus is never beginning anything. He's God. Now, in his human form, he is. But when Jesus begins speaking, he's speaking to them based on where they're at and where they need to be. And they knew because by the time he was done with that parable, they said, uh, they knew he was talking about us. They hated what he was saying. It wasn't palatable to them. Right? Based on where you are at in life, God will speak to you at that level to get you to the level he needs you to be. And if you don't receive it, somebody say, it's parable talk time. You're going to learn the hard way. That happened to David. 
The, he took one man's wife when he had multiple wives, and he shouldn't have even had multiple wives. He thought he had gotten away with it. Time had passed. Here comes Nathan the prophet. David's chilling in his home. And here comes Nathan the prophet. And he tells him, let me tell you a story, David. Somebody say, it's parable time. He said, there was a man with one sheep. He loved him. He used to sleep on his chest. That's the only sheep he had. And, you know, there was another man who had a lot of sheep. And the man with a lot of sheep went and stole that one sheep from that one man. What should they do to him? David screamed. He got so caught up like we get in our Mexican novelas and the movies. And he said, kill him. Yeah. And Nathan said, it's parable talk. Thou art the man. And if you don't learn parable talk, you will go from parable talk to real life heartache and God will deliver a message at you because he can't get to you. I'm telling you, it pays to learn to hear the voice of the Lord. You're here because God called you to come to the river. He's told you to come to the river. He'll meet you, match you, beat you, get to you, and start you. That's what he'll do. Tell your neighbor, do you want to learn the hard way? You like this last statement I'm going to close with? Satan answers prayers too. Satan? <laughs> yeah. Satan answers prayers too. God has messengers, and they are as much the voice of God and God him, as God himself. To reject them is to reject God's voice. To fall asleep in the face of a messenger is to fall asleep in front of the mouth and the face of God. I'm trying to teach you to develop a certain attitude that when God speaks, you are so conscious it is God. Sleep goes away. Hunger dies. Weariness falls to the ground. Because you have learned to hear God's voice. This is how I wake up in the middle of the night. And I'm telling you, it sounds creepy, but I can't wake up and it's, my eyes aren't swollen. It's like I hadn't even slept. It's like I slept, but I woke up like I have no symptom of me being asleep. And it sounds creepy. And I've told people, people ask me, and I've told them that, you know, even in Europe, they asked me, and I told them, that, I said, I know it sounds creepy. And they said, yes. And I said, but that's what it is. They said, I want to hear God's voice like you do. I said, when God talks... Nothing takes greater, not even your sleep takes greater importance. But I, God's talking. But I have, God's talking. Pull over on the side of the road, do what you got to do, write it down. God's talking. Right? But are you receptive? Or does every messenger that God sent you, oh no, that's what they do in your church. Oh no, I've been saved longer than you. Those messengers were as much a God when they killed them and when they rejected them. You may say, but uh, sometimes you may wonder why the answer you received is not from God. Or sometimes you may say, that has to be God because I asked God for a boyfriend. Satan answers prayers too. That has to be God because I was praying about that. Satan answers prayers too. Camarada. That's what I had been waiting for, Bishop. I had asked God for a husband, so let me move to the Middle East, to Italy, to Brussels. It's God. Satan, my friend. Whew. He answers prayer too. He answers prayer too. Yes, he does. But I had asked God for money. I had asked God for money. I mean... How God does it, babe. So I sold some weed. I got the money. But I needed the money. I know I saw the thousand dollars fall out of the lady's purse. Is it I've been lonely and I told God I wanted a godly woman and you moved in and slept with her and calling her God? Satan answers prayer. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, not my words, because Satan can work the words. And if anybody can use God's words, but it ain't, it's the voice. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. Last week, we, last time I was with you, I told you God wanted to restore the right ear. Now God's tuning the ear. And we're going to start getting real specific, and I'm going to teach you some stuff. And we're going to start practicing listening to God's voice. But if you won't hear him on how to deal with the little stuff, don't ask him to show you national stuff. 
Amen. And show me the lottery numbers. No. God wants to show you. Now, what do you do when God tells you something? Do it. Confess it. And I confess this church is packed out at 9.15. 11 o'clock. I confess you're blessed. I confess the word of the Lord. Do you receive the word of the Lord? I confess you will never be tripped up by Satan. Do you receive the word? Are you receptive to the word of the Lord? Or are you going to let your feelings and your thoughts and your opinions block what God is saying and therefore get a mis... We, the Bible says we get an engrafted word. The Bible says the word that we have received, an engrafted word, it becomes one with us. It's not outside of us and we agree with it. It's part of us. It's engrafted. Messed up people get twisted words. Christians get engrafted words. That's why you got people living twisted words instead of engrafted words. Can we pray together right there where you're at? Father, we come before you today and we thank you. Continue to restore the ear of the church. She's just to hear your voice. And we're going to listen and we're going to do and we're going to say, and Lord, I pray for everybody. Anoint them to be evangelists, Father God, to go out to preach the gospel, that people will be receptive as they go out there and listen to them and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they'll make the River Worship Center their church. And thereby, Father God, they will have many people that they'll be discipling and producing disciples themselves and disciple makers. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, our ears belong to you. Amen. You know, years ago, there was a song that it would say, I can get no satisfaction. You know, we want to be satisfied. That's what we long. And I believe this word is satisfying your soul. You know, there's one thing to be pacified. It's another thing to be satisfied. You know, you give someone immature or a baby rather a pacifier but eventually that baby begins to realize there's no real substance behind that pacifier i know that for a lot of people that are immature believers they get little pacifiers little quotes little sayings little warm feelings and goosebumps but i believe that if you're listening today you don't want to be pacified you want to be satisfied and so i hope that you receive this word receptivity let me pray with you father in the name of jesus i pray for these individuals and for myself that they would receive all that you have for them I receive all that you have for me that we would thereby live a life that is not pacified but satisfied how do we know it's satisfied because we begin to share it with others so Lord let this word be poured into other lives and produce more viewers in the name of Jesus amen don't forget to stick with us to invest in what you're hearing in the word of the Lord and let God minister to you in the name of Jesus we're going to hear from you again and you're going to see us again here same time catch us here at the river worship center receptivity